I'm joined today by Rene De Silva, the CEO of the Health Management Academy. Prior to joining the Academy, Rene served as Executive Vice President and Chief Talent Officer at EAB and Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing at the Advisory Board. Rene serves on the board of Innova Health System and is a passionate advocate for health equity. Rene leads the Mosaic Network, a joint venture project to boost the number of people of color in board level roles in healthcare companies. In this episode of Tuning Healthcare, Rene and I discuss health equality and how she is both working to drive the diversity into the boardroom and also use data to improve health equity. How she transformed and led the Academy through the pandemic, an organization that prior to COVID had 65 in-person meetings a year. The key issues she's hearing from CEOs of health systems, and in particular, how they tackle workforce issues, and the opportunity for health systems to lead the transformation of healthcare. Join Renee and me as we tune healthcare. Renee, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to have you with us, um, not only for your own role and your own perspectives, but also given the Academy's role and, and the perspectives that you share and, and understand from so many of your members is, is going to be really fascinating for us to hear. So before we jump into um, sort of healthcare and the issues facing our industry, tell us a little bit about your background and, and how did you end up in healthcare? Yes. Well, first, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really happy to have our conversation today. Um, so in terms of background, I am from Rhode Island, which is a very small community and uh, spent all of my life there. Ended up getting into healthcare somewhat accidentally, which I think is how many of our career paths go. They tend to not be so linear. So after graduating from Syracuse, I joined Accenture, loved that work, was actually focusing on consumer products at the time and began to develop a pretty good technical acumen. And then I woke up one day and realized that I actually don't, I like to talk to people and my, my sort of personality tends to be a bit more extroverted. And so I started to do, I wanted to relocate from Rhode Island. And so I looked at opportunities within the DC metro area and came upon this at the time, small company at the Watergate in Washington, DC called the advisory board. And that is where I got my first introduction to healthcare, which has been a now 20 plus career path, but it started with going out and meeting with hospital executives one by one and learning the story of, of healthcare from the lens of an administrator in a local market. And at the advisory board, did that sort of cement your interest in healthcare or was, it a, was there a particular event or was it just, just sort of this continuation of, of working in healthcare and, and that sort of became your path? Yeah, I think you got an appreciation for the complexity of healthcare, the importance of it from a mission perspective, both in terms of how you deliver on the needs of the community, the fact that it's such a major employer. And so what I think kept me in it was the complexity meant you could really never become an expert, right? Because the breadth and depth is so is so significant. And I was able to learn different elements. So if I started off on maybe an operational project, I could then go into something that may have been more strategic in nature. So I think that is what cemented the interest and, and kept me engaged in it um, for my entire career. That's great. And so I think it's about three years now since you, maybe a little under, that you took over the reins of, of the... Academy. And I must admit, from my perspective, I think um, you run the best events. Um, they're substantive, they're, they're small, so that you can have, you know, engaging conversation. Uh, you have, so, uh, you know, sort of a who's who list of members. Um, but what was what was your impetus for, for taking that role um, and sort of furthering the, the Academy as a, as a sort of a platform for healthcare engagement? Yeah, so I'm about three, almost three years into my tenure. I would say my the, the reason why I took the role was because I think the platform and the folks that we engage have the ability to transform the industry. So if I could describe us, I would say the core of who we are, and I agree, I think our meetings are fabulous. It doesn't hurt that, that uh, we get to go to such wonderful places with our members a couple of times a year, but I would say the core of who we are is we are um, a convener. So we bring together peers and network to really talk about issues that are impacting the industry. And I think that platform of chatting with the largest health systems across the country and the industry organizations that are a key part of that transformation was the initial draw. And then as I think about where we can continue to extend our reach and have an impact is if our core is 
peer-based networks, leadership development, and convening, we are now trying to say, okay, how do you take all of those insights that we're hearing from our members and package them in a way to be much more of a insights generator and the ability to drive the industry forward in an asynchronous way? And then the third piece that I think we can activate on would be just how do you then animate around strategic partnerships and alliances that have the potential to even do that on steroids. And so I came because the platform and I could see the potential of extending our impact. And I, and I think through the COVID experience that we've all gone through, I think we're much clearer in how, how that could actually play out. So tell us a little bit about those alliances. When, when you say partnerships and alliances, yeah. um, what, what, what comes top of mind to you? Yeah, so I think the one that comes uh, most, that's most salient right now would be, we have seen through COVID that the, the gaps in health equity are at an all-time high, right? And that has shown a spotlight on an issue that I think we all knew existed. I think the alliance that we're building now around health equity is bringing together large providers, industry organizations, potentially some not-for-profits that could come to the table and really think through if at scale we wanted to continue to really make progress on health equity, how would you do that in a way where you bring together the power of the, 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 the larger ecosystem to move that? So that would be one example of, of an alliance that we're currently building. So uh, I'm passionate also about the, the inequality of healthcare in, in this country and mentioned it, oh, I think already a couple of times on this podcast that I live in the Bronx and one and a half miles away from, from Manhattan. And um, there's a five year difference in um, longevity of life, right? Between the Bronx and, and Manhattan, which is, which is just crazy when you think it's literally a mile um, different. Um, and so I know you've um, involved with Mosaic Network, network and um, um, other things around um, health equity. Um, tell us a little bit about Mosaic and then also I'd love to delve into what, what could we do more around driving um, um, health equality and, and what would you like to see from, from your member organizations who obviously can play a massive role um, in, in helping to solve this, this problem that we have all across America? Certainly. So Mosaic, the mission of that organization, this is this will be a 501c3 that the Academy co-founds along with Welsh Carson, Oxion, and Town Hall Ventures. And the thesis a powerful here, group. Yes, yeah, a good group. And <laughs> and and again, we'll 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 build bridges with other organizations as well. But this is really around the representation part of the DE and I agenda. And our premise there is that we know that there's a lack of black and brown executives in board roles. And um, my personal perspective is that it's less about the readiness of the executive. It's there's an issue with the talent being less visible. And so the purpose of Mosaic is to bring together private equity, venture, other healthcare companies who are committed to board level diversification with a talent pool that is ready to serve. And so I think the way that that connects back then to the equity and outcomes piece of it is we know that if you have people around the table with a different lived experience, they will ask the questions and will have a perspective that would be important to represent. And so I think if you look at how, as an industry, we really want to impact outcomes, it is both in the decision-making body, both operational leaders and directors and, and folks that are in governance positions being committed to it. And I think that that senior level commitment is important. And then on the ground in terms of what we'd want to see from the broader community, I think there's a lot to unpack there, which I'm happy to elaborate on. But let me just sort of pause for a second and say, I do think a key part of it is better representation in senior level roles as an important catalyzer for driving through equity outcomes at scale. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and so let's delve into what you what we, some of the things that we could do on the ground. So if you, um, if you're gathering a group of, of executives, uh, as I'm sure you will as you get back together and, and this will be a topic you discuss, um, what are some of the things that um, you know, a health system executive listening now um, could and should be doing um, that perhaps their organizations are not doing as well as we would like them to do? Yeah, so maybe I'll answer that by sharing the things that I'm noting that I, that I think are a really good start, right? So I note that there's a commitment 
to looking at the the data in a way that is um, representative of the whole community. And I'm seeing some of our more innovative members standing up equity committees of the board and ensuring that every quality metric, every workforce um, workforce metric is cut by race, ethnicity, primary language spoken, sexual orientation. And so I think just the mining the gaps in the data is a big part of how you would activate around a strategy. Um, I would also add, I've been impressed to see, and this gets back to where we started with Mosaic, but many of our members are using established employee resource groups to understand the needs in the community at a, at a level that would be different than a leader who's inside the organization's ability to do it. So an, a great example of that would be Yale uh, New Haven um, has done some really great work around greater diversification on clinical trials. They did that through bridge building with the AME Zion Church in, in the uh, New Haven market, as well as a, um, a Latino organization that is, that is local to Yale New Haven as well, or local to New Haven as well. So I think it's taking your internal folks and figuring out how to activate those into the community around the gaps that your data indicates is a is a is a good place to start. Yeah, uh, I think that's critical. Fun enough, I was having a conversation yesterday with a friend who um, who is vaccinated, um, um, a, a member of of the black community, and she um, she shared there's just fear, right? There's fear among her her friends and family that. Um, that because of the inequality that's existed for years, that the vaccine might not be the same as, as the one being administered elsewhere, that, um, you know, any other different fears that come into it. And so we had that exact same conversation around how do we use her church as a, as a, a sort of a ground to, to educate, to, to build trust. To, and so, um, you know, we had the conversation um, a while ago, we had it again yesterday, and um, um, now her church is um, has recently started vaccinating on site, and that's, right. that, um, that's made a massive difference to to sort of trust and belief, and and um, you know there's there are clearly barriers that need to be amended, as well as um, you know it's not just about driving a mobile unit into different communities, and and that's that's good, but that's it seems that's insufficient. That's right. Yeah, I think your sentiment around there have been instances historically where trust has been broken and the way that you rebuild that will have to be from working within communities that have already created and, and engendered that trust. And I, I think many of our providers are really leaning into that in a way that I think is important. Right. So let's let's switch back to the academy for a second. Yes. Um, and so I've I've been a fascinated observer of leadership during the, the last year. And I've seen leaders that are paralyzed um, and um, doing things that sometimes seem really crazy because they've been paralyzed and then they feel like, oh, I need to act. And then they act and it sometimes doesn't make sense. And then you've seen, and we've seen some unbelievable leaders who have managed to maintain calm and yet continue to drive a strategic agenda, pivot where necessary. So let's start first with the academy itself, right? 65 in-person meetings. Um, you know, you, you couldn't have you couldn't have written a script that was that was more potentially harming. I, I don't think you could have done scenario planning in in any strategic planning process that would have that someone would have said, "What happens if we can't do any meetings in person?" And so, so start with the academy. Sure. You clearly led the academy. Um, you know, incredibly well through the last through the last year. Um, tell us how you did that, and um, and sort of what it what was the um, you know what was the inspiration for 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 you as you went through that process. Yes, I would agree. It was a bad time to be leading a company that 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 produces sixty five live events a year in the middle of a pandemic. So yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, I think our motivation was, so take the meetings aside, what is our mission? Our, our mission is to really put members at the center of all that we do. And what we recognized at that time, particularly in the early days, was that there was a huge need to fast cycle learnings and to be a really agile learning organization. And so we just pivoted our model to be able to meet our members where they were and just help them information share in a way that would allow them, I mean, it was very simple things in the beginning, like how do you think about 
uh, your workforce policies in the midst of COVID? How are you standing up? What does a good command center structure look like and who's running it? So the first thing was serve members. And I think our team is very wired to do that. And so we we started by just making, making having all that come together. So for us, the pivot was, was virtual. I think we did it in a way that still felt true to our roots, which felt small and curated around the virtual table at that time and, and really tried to be valuable in the moment. It also, and I've noted this from our, 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 our members, strong member leaders too, it was also a chance for us to figure out what parts of our business needed to adapt. And so you know, one of the things that many of our members would often give us feedback on was we had great sessions in the moment, but all of that insight was left on the cutting room floor. It was just left in the room. And so part of what we've done is we launched a, a set of services and tried to add value by just packaging the insight to support asynchronous learning, given how busy people were. And that now will become a standalone offering that we that we provide because we think there's value in, in that. So I think those are the two things, rapid cycle learning, facilitating it, and then really doubling down on our own ability to package and, and share that insight out in asynchronous ways as broadly as possible. And um, I would say also uh, making sure that we were very clear on what the value was to each individual member and having a number of calls and making sure that we were meeting people where they were. And that would include our industry and our health system members alike. So as any, um, any great leader, you've, you've obviously focused on um, your customer and how, and how you can help and, and how you did help your customer. Um, tell us a little bit also about um, how you helped your own employees through it, because um, one of the things that I, I think is striking about your leadership, right, is, is, is that you do it with sort of compassion, right, in, in um, sort of combination with the drive to, for excellence. And so, um, so you've obviously got to serve your members, but at the same time, you have um, an employee force that um, was gathering in person um, 65 times a year. Okay, they don't all go to every event, but, but you get the gist. Mm-hmm. And, and so how did you, what, what are sort of some of the challenges you had with your own employees and, and how did you overcome those? Yeah, so I would say we asked a lot from them, right? So the pivot from 65 live events turned into 300 virtual events and the level of orchestration required to execute on that was not insignificant. And it tends to be not quite as fun, right? Because it's higher volume and there's a lot of administravia and the details around that. And so I, I think that was, we just required a lot of them. I, I think for me, the, the piece that we, we really work hard to do and, and would just be to really frequent communication, trying to attach how this really still is very much mission. So member at the center in every interaction, trying to make sure that they tracked with that. And I think probably most importantly, and this has been a learning for me as I've matured in my own leadership, is just admitting, just taking things off the table and just even myself coming to a session saying, guys, this has been like a tough week and I just don't have the energy that I normally have. And so just giving permission for it to not always be all good. And sometimes you, you just, you're, you're having, you're struggling. Many of us are caretakers. I myself have three children. And so you're also trying to manage school situations and a very full house. And so I think what we really tried to do was make it okay to not always be okay and still having to serve the needs of the member, but creating space for folks just to take a breath when possible. And doing that tactically, it's one thing to say it, but then it's, you know, we implemented a number of what we just called team out days where people could just take the time that they needed. We did a lot more around sort of summer Fridays. I'm now implementing a no Zoom Friday rule because I think now (laughs) it's been just the video just becomes the the challenge. So I, I just think it's trying to dial up your your empathy, being comfortable, being vulnerable yourself and trying to focus on what's important. And in some ways, taking some things off the table is generally how I've tried to approach it. Yeah. So um, we have a mantra around um, our organization, which is if everything's equally important, everything's equally unimportant. Right. And so prioritizing is always is always critical. And I couldn't agree with you more in, in this world. Um, the other thing that I thought was fascinating, which um, there's an article recently in The Wall Street Journal by the new CEO of UPS, and she was teaching her organization to say no. 
mm. um, to, to say these are things that we can't do um, because they also have obviously a service culture and in a service culture you always want to say yes and sometimes that's not good for the customer if you're not the right person to be serving that customer and obviously that's not good for your organization so it's a fascinating article about teaching teaching an organization to say no which is um you know perhaps more important now than ever i agree i'll have to look at that that's great yeah. um so um one of the things you mentioned in um as you as you talked about the transition through the pandemic was sort of the the new table and so i know you've you've got your new podcast um or the new season of of your podcast which um which you're calling the academy table um which uh, it sounds like a fantastic name i um, i can guess what what the meaning of it is but i'd love you to share sure. sort of the meaning of the of 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 the table and also i think this might be the first time that we've had a guest on the podcast that's also the host of another <laughs> podcast so so that's a first as well so so um we're excited to hear um, your podcast. And so tell us about the Academy table. Sure. And Nigel, I'm, I'm taking notes too on what I can learn from you because it sounds like you've done at least 20 more recordings than I've done. So I'm learning as we chat. Um, so for me, the, the, the name, the table, two reasons for that. One is it, it's really core to who we are as an organization. We curate tables and we drive interesting conversations. And I think the podcast is another format for that. And then I do think back to where we started our conversation, there is a national dialogue around the importance of having new voices represented and making space at the table and making them feel more included at the table. And so I do hope that I can have that niche of, I want folks to hear from people that we all know, but I also want to invite people who have interesting perspectives that you may not have, met, you may not have heard of. And so that, that's the other piece of it. And then just fun, you know, if I think about what I miss most from COVID is just uh, sitting around the table with my girlfriends, having a glass of wine and just catching up. And so I hope that that's what we're able to accomplish through our, our, our new season of the Academy's podcast. No, I love, I love the image of it. And so similarly for us, our, our dining room table has, has always been a, a source of great conversation, a source of great entertainment. Um, we host lots of people around the dining table. So I've got this image of, of you hosting a table like of like eight people on, and it's going to be an, going to be your podcast as we, when we can re get, get back together and you can have this conversation, dynamic conversation going on and your podcast can capture this uh, dynamic uh, table conversation that I think we all miss enormously. Um, the good so news also, I would say for the Academy, at least from my perspective and from people I speak to is that there's a, there's a thirst to get back together. And, and, and maybe there are many things that we did in person that we now know we can do remotely, but there's enormous number of things that we can't. And, and so yeah, I think that's I'm right. confident you'll, you'll, you'll see people come back together pretty, pretty rapidly. I think that's right. People miss just the casual sidebars, right? That you can't accomplish via a Zoom and just the, the coffee table chats. I think people are, are hungry for. So I agree with that. Yeah, that's actually what I miss the most. It's actually not the meeting itself, but it's the 10 minutes before and the 10 minutes after. I I miss that enormously. Those were those were my favorite often my favorite part of of interacting with people on the road. Um so one of the things that I I think is is fascinating about about your role is that you interact with so many different leaders um and organizations um across the healthcare um spectrum right and or across the country um within lots of different types of health systems so what are you seeing and hearing from your member organizations right now and does that differ by by type of organization does it differ by role um what, what are you hearing and seeing what are the top things that are concerning to to your members right now sure maybe i'll, I'll start by channeling what i'm hearing in our ceo conversations because I, I do spend a lot of time with that that constituency directly so I would say, for the most part, they feel like they have packaged and learned the lessons from COVID and are really eager to have a much more future focused lens. And so many of the conversations tend to be, how might I think about the healthcare landscape with a broader aperture five, 10 years out? And what will be the forces animating with that time horizon that I need to be thoughtful about now? And so where that generally goes in terms of what does that mean practically? Significant interest in chatting about all of the workforce issues. And it's, it's really two parts on that. Part one is 
the culture and how do I meet my 35, 100,000, sometimes larger workforces where they are. So where will work be conducted? What will be the demand for uh, continuing to stay virtual in some settings? How do I think about redesigning care delivery teams to be mindful of, of how these shifts have to happen? How do I lead from the middle, right? So one of the other things that we've all seen is in this period of time, there's sort of polarized views on both ends and CEOs are being asked to sometimes hold a position. And how, how do you really think about that as leaders, national leaders and really big regional leaders? So I think all of the workforce pieces are in there, not to mention margins are still under pressure. Reimbursement will never be higher than it is. And so what does that then mean around how do I need to think about efficiencies and trade-offs and taking expense out given that workforce represents probably 55% of overall labor, overall expenses. And so I think a lot of issues around workforce um, activation come up. I do think this transformation, how do I think about structuring my assets appropriately, omni-channel, what's the mix of, obviously I have heavy physical infrastructure, but how do I pepper in the more uh, access friendly, more consumer friendly points of, of the healthcare landscape that comes up a ton. And maybe the third, I would say, and I, I actually would love your take on this too, would be systemness. And so we've talked about that for as long as I can remember. I think this pandemic has really proven that if you're not operating as a true operating system, if you still have any holding company DNA in you, it's going to be really hard to be successful. And so I do think this notion of how do I synchronize across large regions and sometimes multiple states is top of mind for that group as well. Yeah, so I think that's, um, um, I think that's true across lots of different organizations um, that um, um, silos will, will suffer, right? Um, uh, perhaps more than ever in a post-pandemic world, and as a, as health systems, um, I think that um, you know there's there's that balance right between bringing the capabilities and the structure and the the quality of sort of uh, of a larger organization, but yet recognizing the needs of the locale in which you operate, and even within a health system, there can be stark differences between often the mothership that tends to be in a more urban setting and some of the local hospitals that tend to be more rural. And, and so understanding and continuing to, to get that mix right, I think is going to be critically important to health systems um, as, they, as they move forward. What are you seeing in terms of um, um, sort of the transformation piece? Um, you know, we're seeing um, increasing number of health system execs saying, uh, because of those those two dynamics you just mentioned, right? Uh, margins continuing under pressure, reimbursement never being higher. We're seeing an increasing number of execs say, you know, I need to move faster to value-based payments because that will protect my uh, my revenue. Um, and and um, in an era where I knew that was coming, but I see that now coming faster. Are you seeing something similar, or are you just seeing? that I've got so many other things to deal with now um, that I, I really just have to push that off. No, I, I, I think it's, I think the vulnerability of a fee for service model was definitely uh, came through in terms of the, the COVID experience. We, we track this closely. I, I'd love, I'd love any of your recent data on it. I, I do think there is many will mention that they, they need to do more. They need to accelerate. They need to figure out how to move that needle. Are they doing it with enough urgency I'm not sure. Right. And Maybe so there's something that I... there's something that actually keeps me up at night. Um, um, because uh, as you know, Lumaris is all about the health system, right? we we believe the health system is absolutely critical component in the delivery of healthcare. Um, it's not going to go away. It can't go away. Um, it serves the largest number of people uh, more than any other sort of, a sector of the of the healthcare industry, um, it interacts. It's the most trusted brand in the market. It is um, it is best place to be the leader of healthcare transformation. Um, but what worries me enormously is that um, uh, too many leaders are, um, are are not moving fast enough. 
and that they, the payers are, are going to continue to do what the payers need to do to protect their business model. They're a little bit more cutthroat. Um, and I don't actually mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a way of, of people that look after their business model and the, and when I, and, and, and people often think of looking after your business model as a, as a negative term, but really that's looking after your employees and looking after your shareholders. And, and that's, that's the responsible thing to do in many ways. Um, and so, so I worry that the health systems are, are not moving, are not moving fast enough and, uh, are a little bit, um, shy to make some of the critical decisions that they need to make. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. I think it comes down to the the business model and and what your current your, you know, in year or next couple of year balance sheet is is sort of anchored on and and I I think it that that probably makes it a little bit harder. I'm just thinking back when when we look at the different metrics that folks are tracking in terms of whether it's at the board level or just management, it, it tends to be some of the traditional metrics that would probably have not changed across 10 years. So I, I think it's probably fair to say that perhaps there needs to be another wave of this, um, that I do think there's greater appetite given where we are now uh, as a country, but I think there's, there's still some momentum to be built, is my sense. Right. So we're seeing a lot of um, trends that have been accelerated through the pandemic, um, Obviously, telehealth exploded. It's it's gone down uh, again recently, but still way above above what it was pre-pandemic. Home health, um, you know, just given all the things that we've discussed even today, the the need for behavioral health is is more acute than ever. Um, you know, not just in terms of the the health equality that we talk we spoke about, but just all the different things that that we've touched on um, have have behavioral and mental health implications. Um, so which of these trends that we're sort of seeing accelerate um, in healthcare, do you think uh, are going to sort of be boomerangs, right? And we're going to go straight back to, to the way we were before. And which do you think will be Frisbees that are trends that we'll see um, grow and, and be really um, sort of fundamental to how healthcare and health systems operate um, moving forward? I love this question. Um... I'm a little bit worried that the virtual health will feel a bit more like a boomerang than 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 we all might like. Yes, better than where we were pre-pandemic, but probably not necessarily as as anchored into the DNA as as we might like. There are certainly some systems that are exceptions to this, but I think it's still pretty hard to navigate. It, it certainly is nothing close to what you'd get from some vendors that are you know that's their core business model, and so I, I do think maybe some backsliding on physician adoption and just how it fits in the broader realm of things um, is important. What will the regulatory and reimbursement environment be look like? If that doesn't stick, then I, I think there's some risk there. Um, in terms of your Frisbee, I do think this agility and this now acknowledgement that they can make pros- progress much faster than they anticipated is going to stick. So I, I note that I think I think there is a greater urgency around all things because they did see how when they had to when they had to maximize virtual health as an example they were able to figure out all the reasons why it previously couldn't work um, when they had to really accelerate on their supply chain they figured that out so I, I do think this agility more rapid decision making operating more agile not holding sacred cows I I, I do think that is going to be a trend that we continue to see. You know, I think the not holding sacred cows is perhaps one of the most important business lessons that I ever received early on in my career. Um, and I've always told my team, right, if the reason to do something is because we did it yesterday, that is a really bad reason. Um, and so come back with another one, right? That's because, right. Because we need to have, um, we, it's, it just hampers growth, right? And, and that's, um, that's definitely a challenge. Um, and so as you um, look out to your, um, your role, I, you obviously have an amazing platform to, to not just interact and get the feedback from your member organizations, but also to influence how they, how they think about these topics. Um, what are sort of, as, as you think about pulling back together the, the first CEO forum that you pull back together, what, what will be like the top couple of topics that you expect to be on the agenda? Yeah, I, d- I definitely think this notion of what are the major forces shifting us and what is our own predictions as to how transformative that will be will be a big part of the conversation and getting input 
from them directly and just doing a little bit of the gap assessment of do we believe differently, you know, based upon our, our prototype or archetype. So if I'm all in on fee for service versus I have really adopted a pop health strategy, I might feel differently about it. So a little bit of heat and debate around that I think would be good. Right. Um, I, I do think this notion of scale and what are the benefits of scale and then the maybe counter argument to that would be think about where disruption has happened in other industries. It's more been where where you were not encumbered by scale, you could be more agile, right? So if you think about fintech and other innovations there, it's it's sort of, or even the, um, the Ubers and Lyfts of the world, they sort of ran counter to scale. So I think this debate around what is big enough and, and how do we think about that will definitely be top of mind. Consumer is a big one. You know, this is an area to where your earlier question around, is there urgency around issues? So we did a survey recently where I think there was 80% alignment around becoming more agile and easier for consumers was, you know, everybody agreed with that. In the evaluation of our performance against that metric, a really big gap between important, critical, and our performance was a really wide gap. And so I want to, like, what's the right way to move that conversation? It's not a new conversation, but it's one that needs, a, I think, a new lens to it. So those are those are a few flavors. Right. I don't know what am I missing. What would you add? Um, so I, I think you've 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 hit most of them. I, I I think that last one is in one in particular that I'm um, enormously passionate about. Um, it literally drives me nuts, and we've discussed it on on a number of these podcasts um, that we the consumer experience in healthcare continues to be for the most part unacceptable, and and we all talk about patient centered care but we really continue to have physician centric care and the the experience we get going into you know Nordstrom or a Marriott hotel or anything that we do in the normal course of our lives um you know our normal lives pre pandemic um the the experience we get is is very very different to the experience we have when we interact with the healthcare system i think there's an unbelievable opportunity for the health system to take the lead in driving a true consumer behavior, even the most basic things like I show up to the doctor and 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 they have in it can be an Excel spreadsheet to start. They have, um, you know, Nigel, great to see you. Last time I noticed you like you like lemon tea. Can I get you a lemon tea? Right. I mean, just that one little thing that can be kept on a spreadsheet would be would be transformational in terms of how how I think about and interact with uh, with that office and in terms of driving stickiness in terms of and ultimately driving better healthcare because I think that will you know, a better consumer environment will lead to a a, a more um, you know compliant consumer which is which is part of the the healthcare equation um, so I think that's um, that's a critical one um, I think it's um, you know putting a Lumeris lens on it, it's, um, uh, I think the, the question is, um, you know, we're seeing an uptick in the pace at which people want to move to value-based care. I think it's, um, it's, I would, I would, I would be interested in, in understanding, um, you know, to how the health systems see that, how do they differ by, by sort of the environments in which they operate. And then tied to that, how do they, how do they really de-risk that that move right how do they do it in a way that um enables them to um not put the sort of the the core at risk and there's obviously a um a great book crossing the chasm right which is which is so critical to understanding how you move business models from one to the other but how do they do that in a way that um enables them to maintain sort of the core business but but drive um transformation at a at a, at a higher rate, because as we discussed earlier, it worries me that, um, that others, there are a lot of forces, right? Not just the payers, the, the independent primary care practices, mm -hmm. there are a lot of forces that are, that are not favoring the health system right now, government um, regulation move. Um, so I think the, the, the fee for service train ended a long time ago in terms of its future. Um, you know, we're still running the old models and, and those are going to continue to run for a number of years, but the fee for value chain is the, is the future. And, and you have to, the quicker you adopt it and the quicker you understand what you need to be successful in it, the, the better those health systems um, will be. But we remain passionate that they, they are the core 
and have the best opportunity to drive um, a really transformational healthcare system in this country. I think that's right. So we like to end with what we call the quick fire round. Um, and so uh, what's the best piece of advice you were ever given? That I was ever given? Um, Business advice, I guess. Or you can, whatever type of advice you want. Could be anything. Yeah, I was going to go to, this goes back to the leadership piece of it, was a, a, a former boss took me to, to the side and said that I needed to work on how my vulnerability came across, that I sometimes just came across as just having, just being too much of a... Uh, <laughs> glass shield in front of me. And if people can't relate to you, if they feel like they don't, that you don't get them, then you're going to, it's going to be really hard for you to create a following and have people want to work with you. And that I remember it stinging at the time, but I, I do think it really shifted how I try to show up. And that, that probably was the single piece of advice that I've gotten that has, has stuck with me. The best advice often does sting at it the time. It hurts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I always, I always say to my team, <laughs> feedback is a gift, but you might yeah. not always like it, but yes, yeah. that's so true. As long as you internalize it later, that's all that matters. Um, what do you do to relax, have fun? So I um, I mentioned I have three kids and they're all into athletics and I turn into a different person on the sideline of any kid's sporting event. Um, and so for me, that is where I'm in the moment. I'm not thinking about what needs to happen at work. I'm just totally plugged in. And so whether it's my two daughters who play volleyball or my son who plays basketball, that is definitely my happy place. And so... Um, and, and it's starting to come back. So we had our first travel tournament last week and it made me, it made my heart happy. Yeah, no, uh, sport is, uh, is an amazing, um, learning ground for, for business in many ways. It I is. Mean, uh, it is. I love to hire athletes because I think if you can learn how to, um, win and lose gracefully and just the balance that it takes, it, it typically serves you well throughout life. So I know this is supposed to be the quick fire round, but um, I, I hope you're not one of those parents that I first met the first time I came to America and, um, I played sport to a pretty high level. Um, but, um, when I first came to America, I went to my nephew's, um, little league game. He's <laughs> like three, maybe four, not like, like I'm talking like there wasn't a kid with ability to make the, the pros with anywhere within sight and the, the swearing and the uh, aggressiveness of the parent body on the side just shocked me. It's crazy. I've yeah. never seen anything like that. And as I said, I played pretty high level, but the parents were, I'd never seen anything like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's not, that's not Renee on the, on the I don't side think so. But if you think that's <laughs> bad, go to an AAU travel basketball game and you, you haven't seen anything until you've seen that. No, I, I'm not a complainer. I'm just a very loud cheerer. Right. That's good. That's what you should be, particularly for your kids. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, I would tell her sister, just take a breath. Uh, be willing to take some risks. It's okay if you don't get everything right. You can you can fail along the way. I, I just, I think we all hold ourselves to a high standard and most of the time that's good, but sometimes it can be a little bit counterproductive. So all right, that's good advice. And then if you could change one thing about healthcare, what would it be? want just one thing. And let me just close with the story. This actually happened yesterday. I was chatting with a friend who um, had a a baby born with a rare cancer last March. And he is in healthcare 20 years is very savvy on how to navigate the healthcare system. And, and, and the conversation was, I don't, for someone as informed as I am with means and money to sort of subsidize this, it has been a nightmare, not just the diagnosis, but the nightmare of navigating her care path through what is probably one of the most devastating things that could happen to you. And so I think we can do better as a country to help navigate and um, meet people in their biggest moments. And so I, I think if we could figure that out, how to, how to per- work with people at, at that time, that would be, we, we would, I think we would all feel better about the industry. Right. So true. Renee, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's just um, incredible to hear your perspectives. Um, it's inspiring to to be and learn from a leader who transformed an organization um, that was so reliant on in-person. And and I've got such great confidence coming out of the pandemic that through your leadership, the Academy will not only thrive in a virtual space, but back in person and we'll go from strength to strength. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for that. You'll have to come join me at the Academy table at some point soon too. All right, we'd love to. Thanks, Nigel. Have a good day. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today. 
please follow us on your favorite streamer and don't forget to rate us as it helps others find our podcast. I hope the spring is bringing new hope for all of us for a brighter future. Please join us next time as we tune healthcare. This is Nigel Orenstein in New York.